Hey there, I'm Mr. Terry. I'm a high school history teacher. Welcome back to another History Teacher Reacts video. All right, we're headed back to channel favorite, the fat electrician, and his new video is titled The Real Tank Genius of World War II, Percy Hobo Hobart. Oh, you know this is going to be a great story. All right, the original video is down below. Make sure you are supporting him. All right, let's check this out together. All right, let's do it. When I started this video, I just wanted to know back how the to World War II. made it onto the beaches at D-Day. And what I found instead is one of the greatest anti-hero stories of all time. Uh -huh. And it rewrote my understanding of history. He's done a bunch right. of anti-hero topics are great. A book on armored warfare, a World War I veteran that was forced into early retirement because his fellow officers didn't like him very much. But after German tanks rampaged through France, I didn't take orders as well. Realizing their new Blitzkrieg tactic, Winston Churchill himself would call upon this man to leave retirement and go toe to toe okay, with so the British German tank commanders, Erwin Rommel and Heinz Guderian. Ladies and gentlemen, the hero of D-Day that you've probably never heard of, hmm, okay. Major General Sir Percy Cleghorn Stanley Hobart, AKA Hobo. Hobo. But first, a word from our like sponsor. That. This video is brought to you by Delete Me. Delete Me is an online subscription service. It's a very it's straightforward, simple business. You give them money, they get rid of your personal information off the internet. Okay, look, here's oh. the deal. Somehow, some way, your personal information is on the internet. Your name, your spouse's name, your parents' name, your address. We all have so much information all over. Phone, I'm gonna let his ad play for sure here. So, all right, uh, yeah. Have you guys heard of uh, heard of this? So, I mean, D-Day was such a large operation that if you submit there's probably so many heroes we probably don't even know of because of a large. I mean, it's the biggest amphibious invasion of all time, on your behalf, right? And you Over this next month or two, and I know what you're thinking because they're going to land like two million thing. troops all my in the northern France. Me either so just think about all the stories that are in there. Okay, already. here's the thing with that. You don't have to give them all your private information. You can literally give them your name and your email address. You can give them more information if you want, but really all they need is your name and email. So I give your personal and information to get rid of your personal later, information. And they just start That's good to have an option to limit that. By using just your name and email, they'll search through all the data banks and figure out who you are, and they'll ask you a bunch of weird questions like is this your dad is this your mom is that a relative is this your address did you used to live here did you grow up at this address is this your phone number is this your email they know all of this information just by you giving them your name and email using all the information that these data brokers have and then mm. you just let them know yes that's me and then they will delete all that information for you a couple days after that they're going to send you a report here was mine over 70 data brokers had my information and there were 489 listings where that information was for sale and delete me submitted opt out requests for all of them. Now, those data brokers are probably going to be able to get my information again, but Delete Me is constantly going to be searching for my info and automatically submitting the requests as soon as those listings pop up. Go check out Delete Me. I'll have a link and a discount code down below. Let's get back to the video. Percy Hobart was born in India in 1885 and joined the British military in 1902. He would then go on okay. to fight in so India, right? Born in India in 1885 and joined the British military in 1902. He now remember, this time, at this time, uh, Britain, or sorry, India is a colony. It's part of the British Empire. So, um, in fact, in World War One, they used a ton of Indians uh, to serve in the military. There's a lot of engagements where, with the British, there were more Indians fighting, you know, uh, than the British were on the British side. And that's a big part of the World War, especially World War I, uh, utilizing your colonies. He would then go on to fight in World War One. While there, in typical anti-hero fashion, he made a name for himself as being extremely effective, but unorthodox and disobedient at the same time. Because of this, many of the other British officers don't really care for him. Despite that, he makes it through World War One, ends up earning himself a military cross, and then in 1919, he goes off to college. Graduates from college four years later in 1923, he then volunteers to be an officer in the Royal Tank Corps. Now, he volunteered because most- Dude, imagine wanting to like stay in the military after you fought in like a war like 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 world war one I, I mean you'd be like yeah i think i'm gonna stick around you'd be like what that was crazy that sucked <laughs> people did not want this position and that's because at this point in time a lot of the high-ranking british officers didn't see the true potential that tanks and armored vehicles had they simply viewed them as a single tool for trench warfare to get from one trench yeah, to the other it's true they didn't realize that one day it was going to replace cavalry percy yeah. hobart on the other hand was a visionary yeah. and saw its true potential and that's why he volunteered not only that he was also very George Patton was like that opinion, too and he would actually the american side a lot of the younger soldiers saw the, the future thing, of mechanized which, warfare honestly isn't a very hard sell the new New guy joins the army and you're like hey quick question did you want to ride a horse into battle or did you want to drive a fucking tank <laughs> for real and everybody's picking a tank and over time his advocacy for change ends up making a lot of the old cavalry officers end up hating him because he's kind of trying to make them obsolete and you have to remember at this point in time the british officer corps is very very clicky like they're socialites and gentlemen and they have to you know conduct themselves in a certain manner and all that 
it's so amazing that you could come out of World War I believing in pre-World War I tactics. The stuff that led to that war being the most devastating war in history. The cavalry charges like that, like those days are over. Did you not see what was going on? Yes, tanks were in their infancy and flight was in their infantry. Infantry, uh, in, sorry, their um, uh, they were in their infancy. But you saw like what what machine guns did, right? At least you saw that. Holding on to old ways is so stupid from from coming out of World War One. Like that's the war that changed and should have and did change all wars. And imagine not being changed by that war as a, as a policymaker, as a strategist. BS. So when Hobart comes in and starts ruffling feathers, it upsets the entire officer corps and they all pretty much hate him at this Jeez. point. Despite that, he knows he's right and he just keeps working on pioneering new tactics and new applications for tanks. Now, one of the few legitimate concerns about having tanks on the battlefield at this point in time was that they were basically autonomous. And what I mean by that is once the tank crew got their orders, hopped in the tank and took off, that was it because tanks didn't have radios and stuff yet at this point in time. So Dude, how crazy was that scene in the new All Quiet on the Western Front? front where they got those tanks saw tanks for the first time that that was like that might have been the climax of the movie Anyway, sorry, I think I cut him off. Tank and took off. That was it because tanks didn't have radios and stuff yet at this point in time. So once they left, you couldn't call them back. You couldn't change up the mission. They couldn't Another thing communicate might with anybody look else. Look ridiculous, but. So Hobart comes out and he's like, well, hey, rather than not using tanks because they can't communicate, how about we just, I don't know, put some radios inside of them? So he fights tooth and nail for like a year to make that happen, gets radios put in all of his tanks, and then trains his guys how to run battle drills, being able to actually communicate with each other and the chain of command. And and guess what? It works exactly how you would expect it to. I mean, this is the upside down catch up yeah, in the tank world. Right. Like somebody finally came out with this idea and everybody's like, how? How did I not come up with that billion dollar idea? At this point, all the junior officers and lower enlisted are like, holy shit, this is awesome. And all the older, more experienced officers that already hated Hobart lose their shit because he's now actively making them look stupid. What? Remember? <laughs> In World War One, they were still using like carrier pigeons. They were using pigeons to like send messages and stuff like that. It's like radio becomes popular around that time. Uh, and it's like that should have been an instant, just like, oh yeah, we this should now be the new standard of war. Are those you are wearing his merchandise? Hercules. So once that gets worked out, he starts that developing years. legitimate battle strategies and drills and training his men on how to conduct tank warfare, how to integrate tanks with infantry. Really, that was one of the hard the things. Groundwork for what would become modern tank warfare. So since tanks were so slow in World War One, it was hard to like use um, infantry because infantry could basically go like faster, and you don't want to sit there for a long, long time crossing through a deadly. You know, a trench. That's why in World War II, when those things were fast, you could work them in very well and have the infantry moving behind them in it, it at a good pace. But yeah, World War One was they were kind of they were kinda, they were very awkward, we should say, and and didn't make a huge impact on the war. I mean, not really, but definitely was a, a, a big introduction. This goes on for a couple of years, and then in 1927, he ends up being a co-respondent in a divorce case. Now, I'll be honest, I had to Google what that meant, but apparently co-respondent is the fancy British officer polite way of saying Percy Hobart was banging somebody else's wife. Her name was Dorothea Field, and of course, she was another British officer's wife. The British, the British have to make everything sound like, have to make everything sound like proper and and stuff just call it what it is right his wife right, we her got some name was Dorothea Field and of course she was another British officer's wife naughty, no. naughty. after that oh, wife, my wife Dorothea and Percy get married pretty much immediately and the rest of the officer corps now absolutely hates him and they actively try to get him kicked out of the military because this is not gentlemanly behavior they're not able to get it done Hobart stays in the military and continues to develop and refine armored warfare and one of the things he starts to do is look back into history and see if there's any less that he can apply to tank warfare. And one of the things that he hones in on is the Mongols. The Mongols were so successful yeah. that they utilized cavalry Let's to go. deep into enemy territory at strategic points, weakening their entire empire. And Hobart says, what if I could do the same thing, but with tanks? And I've asked my students, like, what do you think of if, if, uh, 
like Genghis Khan could have the modern technologies of today, like tanks and stuff like that, but still use it because in a mobile fashion, because that's what the, the Mongols were all about mobility. But let's not remember though, that the, the Mongols could fight in any situation. They could siege cities. They could starve you out like that. But they also, of course, you know, I mean, they're known for their, you know, they hit and run and, and just have that kind of speed. So um, yeah. What do you think that, that treacherous of a military with modern technologies. You already saw how many people they killed. <laughs> to anybody that knows a lot about history, that sounds an awful lot like the German Blitzkrieg tactic, and that's because it is. Yeah, the yeah. Germans didn't come up with the Blitzkrieg. Percy Hobart did. No, Heinz the Mongols German, did. <laughs> the German tank commander that is the architect of the Blitzkrieg is well known to have had every single paper that Percy Hobart published oh, wow. translated into German, and he kept that with him everywhere he went. Yeah, the infamous Wait, German before the Germans actually even did Blitzkrieg? This is before World War II. They're still in the interwar period. So as that stuff was what? Being published? It was being published here in the interwar period. Tank commanders Rommel and Gaderman didn't revolutionize armored warfare. They just copied Hobart's homework. So if Percy oh, Hobart is the sorry. actual general. I, I had a back I had a backwards. My bad. My bad. Blitzkrieg, why don't most people know that? Why does everybody give Germany credit and why they didn't did the it. British use it first? Or at the very least, because they know that it. it was a possibility when it was used against them in France when they got their asses beat in six weeks. That is because the British chain of command hated the man that came up with the Blitzkrieg and for that reason made the entire strategy a failure. And that well, let's remember that the British didn't didn't go on the offensive, right? They had they they you know the war breaks out and there's not much they can do to help france you saw what happened they get booted out of um mainland europe and you know with the dunkirk story basically just have to bunker down and and barely survive the blitz you know the the potential invasion of germany and then it took years you know before they could get an attack mounted with the with the Americans would not have happened to be able to go on the offensive. So I don't know if that was really an opportunity for the British to really use those tactics, right? 1934, Britain conducted a large training exercise where Percy Hobart was going to be allowed to try out his new methods. If you don't know, when you're conducting a large military training exercise, you have like Team A, Team B, and then you have the umpires, so to speak. You have the people making sure that both teams are doing the right things, saying, yeah, that works, no, that doesn't work, declaring who wins and who loses. The umpires conspired against Hobart because they were military officers and they didn't like him and basically made his entire strategy fail. Fast forward, 1937. Hobart is given command of the 1st Armored Division, Great Britain's first modern tank division. Because of this, a bunch of British officers promptly throw a bitch fit and try to get Hobart kicked out of the military again. It fails again, but the chain of command has to come up with a compromise, and that compromise is to take Hobart and send him down to Egypt, where he can take command of the 2nd Armored Division, which was basically, we're going to ship him halfway across the world and then pretend he doesn't exist. <laughs> out of sight, out of mind. Exactly. Right? So Hobart gets down to Egypt, and it is a complete shit show, because tanks are effectively replacing cavalry at this point so it's cavalry officers that are running tank divisions and they have chosen to not read any of the literature or training material that he has spent the last decade developing and they are operating tanks like they are dragoons if you don't do you think do you think the british experience in world war ii would have been you know, like very different um if they had used these tactics what do you guys think I don't know. A dragoon is kind of like cavalry, except it's it's not. They ride in on horses and then they dismount and go into battle on foot. And that's what the second armored division so is being trained to do. They roll up in the tank and then the gunner and the loader stay in the tank while the rest of the crew gets out and fights like infantry while being a static target instead of a moving target, which is the entire point yeah, of being stupid. a fucking tank. The chain of command is effectively trying to do everything Weird. they can to make tanks look bad and ineffective because by extension it makes Hobart look bad and ineffective effective. The running joke when Hobart gets there is that the Egyptian force is the Egyptian farce and the mobile division <laughs> is the immobile Play division. But when Hobart shows up, he turns the entire thing around. Between 1930 good. and 1940, he trains this entire division how to actually conduct tank warfare and they get super effective at it. And the men absolutely love him because Percy Hobart is not only a great teacher, but he actually wants every man under his command to understand what they are doing and why they are doing it. When at this point in time, Time, many other officers don't Builds care trust. about that. They just want you to shut up and follow orders. Right. But Percy Hobart wants you to know what you should be doing and why you should be doing it. That way, if the chain of command ever fails, you can make intelligent decisions regarding what needs to be done. In that, that's that that in, that way of like, I'm going to teach you what to do and why you do it. Like that should be applied in everything. 
in everything. I don't care what your job is. If you were in any kind of leadership position at any type of job, like as a teacher, one of the things I try to make sure to do is tell students, why are we learning this thing? And to be honest, I, I ask myself, like when I'm preparing and you're always doing that. Good teachers, hopefully you're always, always going on years and years and years into teaching, always be analyzing what you're teaching and stuff like that. But, um, we, we should ask, and I know for me, I, I try to think and say, why does, why does my student need to know this? Why do my students need to know this? Why is it important? Okay. Why are we doing it? And if I can't do that, then we should probably move on to the next topic. Because we still have a finite amount of time and everything we do should be something that is uh, r rationally done and has a reason. Like, why are we doing this? Right. And uh, yeah, I think that's good advice for everything. <laughs> Military teaching, whatever. Short, Percy Hobart treats his men like they're grown ass like, men. Here's what we're learning. Here's why it's important. And because of that, he gains overwhelming support from the junior officers and enlisted men. And he becomes immensely popular. No don't like that and because of this they finally force him out of the military because they sent Damn. him down to africa intentionally sabotaged him and yet again he's managed to turn the entire situation around and turns it into a positive thing so they just end up getting him fired in 1940 he is forced into early retirement on his final departure from egypt the men of the second army 1940 he said so that's, I mean, that's right at the beginning of the war. And the entire road to wish him farewell as their sign of how much they actually respected this man. So Percy goes back home, but still wanting to be involved in the military, he joins the Home Guard, which is like the British equivalent of the National Guard. And he okay. gets busted down from they let him? general to corporal, which if you don't know military ranks, is like going from CEO to front desk receptionist. Not that I'm trying to talk bad about receptionists, but I'm trying to give you an accurate depiction yeah, of what a drastic change in authority this is. Everyone's important, Five but... After Hobart's forced into retirement, the German military rolls into France with tanks, utilizing the Blitzkrieg tactic that Percy Hobart designed and completely stomps the British and the French army in a matter of six weeks. Erwin Rommel then goes and proceeds to rampage through North Africa, and the only people that even Rough kind years of for the allies. down are Hobart's men of the 2nd Armored first Division two years, that man. is now known as the 7th Armored Division, aka the Desert Rats. At this point, Winston Churchill starts asking questions and realizes what his officer corps is What done. number was the what number was the ghost division? <laughs> They're cool to learn about. Calls Percy Hobart back into service and awards him the rank of Major General, at which point all of the officers throw a fit yet again, saying that he's 57 years old, he's too old to serve in the military, and they old. try to get him med boarded out. Winston Churchill yet again intervenes and stops the med board and issues this statement. Quote, the high commands of the army are not a club. It is my duty to make sure exceptionally able men, even though not popular with their military contemporaries, are not prevented from giving their service services to the crown translation quit being a bunch of catty bitches we need this guy by the <laughs> um churchill came from that like that that line his family were already like high-ranking basically like aristocrats in uh <coughs> in british society but he got knocked out of that too though with with world war one and the disaster at gallipoli when he was in in charge and uh you know he changed his tune he, he went back to the because you know maybe he changed too because with he he after he got removed from basically his position in the uh in the, in the navy uh command in world war one um he ended up basically going to the front lines after that and got the like ground level perspective of warfare and probably you know maybe gained respect for a lot of people that are down in those levels there's a lot of talent down there right at those lower levels and uh you know made his way back up and then when churchill's back in power after you know chamberlain has to get the boot you know maybe a new perspective there right the time all that political BS came from a done, Rommel upper was class society Europe, and he has been tasked with fortifying the atlantic wall the german defense from norway to spain in case the allies should invade rommel reinforces it with two hundred and sixty thousand men manning over fifteen thousand concrete bunkers need to see all the existing positions. parts the of this that still are around with barbed wire it has anti-vehicle emplacements to prevent tanks and other vehicles from getting up the beach and they lay over 200 million mines and the man put in charge of figuring out how to penetrate those defenses by the way have you ever heard about how bad the leftover mine situation still is like 80 years later um they they like mines will go off 
construction crews when they're building stuff in Europe will it's pretty much just part of their protocol that they are looking out for mines and they'll find them and then they like evacuate neighborhoods and stuff it's still like a major issue and every once in a while you hear of somebody that can like like will die yeah it's crazy other than Percy Hobart. He has re-entered the picture and he knows that these kids have been stealing his homework. He comes in <laughs> with the complete dad energy of, I taught you everything you know, but I didn't teach you everything I know. He takes command of the 79th Tank Regiment and gets to work immediately. It is now Major General Hobart and Erwin Rommel to going toe-to-toe -to -toe in a battle of wits that will determine the fate of the world. And obviously we're gonna handle this issue with tanks, which brings us to problem number one. How are we gonna get tanks on the beach? How are we gonna get a 70,000 pound hunk of metal with a gun from the boat through the water onto the beach obviously we just got to make a tank float and it can't be that hard because battleships float right i mean those are big and heavy and made out of metal so why can't we do the same thing with the tank all you have to do is displace enough water and bada bing bada boom you're floating so all we got to do is increase the surface area of a tank so they take a gigantic tube of wax canvas wrap it around the tank and then have inflatable tubes that when they inflate it the canvas stands straight up and basically it is a tank inside of a giant canvas tube and then we'll just add a couple of little boat propellers on the back of the tank so it'll push itself through the water problem solved sounds stupid works terrific so now that we've got the sherman duplex drive amphibious tank figured out the next problem what is the beach made out of are That's the tanks awesome. going to get hung up and stuck because we can't have that happening either so here's what we're going to do we're going to take a submarine we're going to send them out they're going to wait till night once night falls the sailors are going to go ashore gather up a bunch of the dirt from the beach and figure out what it's made out of it's made out of blue clay probably the worst possible thing because those tanks will for sure get stuck in clay so obviously Obviously, problem number two, how on earth are we going to get the tanks through all this blue clay? It would be really nice if we had a road. You know what? Fuck it. We're just going to bring our own road. Ladies and gentlemen, the bobbin. That is a yeah. church tank with a gigantic spool of canvas that has metal rods inside of it that literally goes ahead first and lays down a road for all the other tanks to drive on right up the beach. A I love like the, the history of seeing how water challenges have an overcome in history. Like you learn about like Julius Caesar and how they would build these bridges in insane amounts of time. Um, but yeah, they're so cool. Like you see that um, another cool one is the ones they use for tanks in the uh, as even more recently. Like look at like the Suez Canal crisis because they brought they brought tanks into that. And you see these like like retractable kind of like folded up bridges that could hold tanks like over like the Nile, like for the, the, the uh, uh, for the Suez um, or sorry for the Suez, not the Nile, but across the Suez Canal. Like it's so cool. It's such an interesting part of military history. Not a lot of people think about, but water is like a major thing when you talk about logistics. Like just think about it, like having to cross with armies and 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 uh, and with uh, gear and now with mechanized warfare, like how much of a challenge that is. Again, it looks really silly, super but impressive. it works super well. And At this point, mud. all the other people mud. that hate Hobart are starting to make fun of them. They're starting to refer to these tanks as Hobart's funnies, but they have no idea how Hobart's important funny. these tanks are going to end up being. I Hobart think it sounds is over awesome. here actually trying to save the world by any means necessary. He realizes it doesn't matter how cool it looks. He just needs it to work, and he only needs it to work once. Meanwhile, while all of his other contemporaries are worried about looking good while they do it. Okay, problem number three, marching Image right so up the beach. Now we have to worry about fools. the mines and the barbed wire. We can't be blowing the tracks off our tanks with mines. We need to clear the barbed wire for the men, and we don't want the barbed wire getting hung up in the tracks of the tank. What are we going to do? Things are about to go from looking that weird and hard. silly to looking terrifying and awesome because the plan for this is to eat the barbed wire and blow up the mines in front of us using Dude, the Sherman Crab, a.k.a. the flail tank. Okay, so just so we're on the same page in theory we have now figured out how to it's like i have known about like you go and you'll play some like some explosives by there to blow it up but i'd never seen that thing before just like a weed whacker <laughs> connected to a tank a fucking tank a mile through the ocean build a road in front of us as we drive it up the beach cut through barbed wire and detonate mines the only defensive structure left is the enormous concrete bunkers with germans inside yeah. shooting machine Artillery guns time. and mortars what are we going to do about them because normal tank guns aren't going to take those out effectively which is a pretty simple solution if your gun isn't big enough just get a bigger gun ladies and gentlemen the petard it is essentially a mortar that is the size of a propane tank a affectionately dubbed the flying dust bin. You call that big? Yeah, the thing's huge. That explains a lot. What is that supposed to mean? You told me eight inches. And you told me you took installments. I didn't know what that meant. <laughs> That's your problem. Interrupting my history time. And it's the flying... <laughs> 
<laughs> I love how in these recent videos he's brought in, you know, Mrs. Electrician, and it's just like it, making fun of each other. It's a, it's a great, that's a great dynamic that they're adding to this series here, if you want to call it that, of, of characters we're introducing. It's so good. Oh. Flying dustbin doesn't work. This one will. The most terrifying of all of the creations, the crocodile, aka the flamethrower tank, pulling in. Oh, flamethrower tanks are bad. I. Hundred gallons of jungle. These are so cool. Capable of shooting flames over. I mean, they're horrifying, yards. but so you know what I mean. So if goes according to plan so far, the enemy is either going to be dead or retreating. Here's the problem: once the enemy starts retreating, they're also going to start blowing up all the bridges behind them, making it very hard to maneuver vehicles, especially tanks, across ravines, rivers, ditches, and so on. So, what are we gonna do once they blow up the bridges? Fuck it, I guess we'll just bring a bridge from home, right? No, I'm not messing with you, ladies and gentlemen. Bridge tank. Yeah! <laughs> yeah! Oh man, it went yes. from this is kind of silly and there's no way that's gonna oh, work yeah. to, oh my god, let's go. terrifying to, okay, now you guys are just showing off. I want, I want every tank, okay? Let's make every every possible tank bridge tank dude bridge tank is bad i don't know what you're thinking that's great but what if it's just a little tiny anti-tank ditch or a ravine not something that really necessitates an entire bridge well that's easy ladies and gentlemen the fascine aka a bundle of sticks the fascist tank fascist tank. so that's it the plan is set hobart has accounted for absolutely that's everything, a fascist and this means plan is for sure gonna work but here's the thing you've probably Bundle seen a bunch of movies or played together. a bunch of video games that incorporate the landing at normandy on d-day and you've never seen any yeah. of this stuff so dude call of duty that? that's because most where have you been video games like saving private ryan for example take place on omaha beach which was one of the american beaches the boring beach and the americans didn't have access to all of hobart's tanks why is that well some people believe that the american leadership saw it and said that it was stupid Stupid, not gonna work and they didn't want anything to do with them America. however that's a myth and it's completely untrue we say come on eisenhower saw hobart's inventions and requested all of them See, that's what i would okay i not just because i'm american i americans are pretty innovative in war like i think they'd be down with that they don't i don't think the americans have that that like that like upper class arrogance that it, it comes from you know, like like years and years of feudalism, <laughs> you know what I mean? Leading up to this, you know, you'd hope there'd be a little bit better understanding. Not enough could be made in time. And the only thing the American forces would be given for D-Day was the Sherman DD duplex drive amphibious tanks. Hey, and the reason. That hey, 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 we had Patton's inflatable army. OK, we had Patton's inflatable army to be a decoy to think that we were going to attack Calais when instead it was going to be Normandy. All right. We got Hollywood to make us inflatable tanks to throw off the Germans and their intelligence, thinking we had a massive army right across the English Channel. All right. That, that was our contribution of innovative stuff. OK focuses on Omaha <laughs> beaches because it's the most dramatic. It's the one beach of the five where absolutely everything went wrong. And believe it or not, one of the main things that went wrong was that the Sherman duplex drive tanks didn't make it. They got released too far off the beach and the seas were too rough uh, and a lot of them ended up sinking. Luckily, only five tankers drowned. The rest were able to escape and get picked back up by the boats. But there. it was a huge issue not having tanks on Omaha beach and it is part of the reason that Omaha was the deadliest beach yeah. on D-Day. If you pay attention and you know what you're looking for, it's even referenced to slaughter in, in those first Ryan hours. Movie. Absolutely. No longer has made it ashore. We've got no TT points on the beach. Dog one is not open. So just so we're all on the same page, the reason most people have never seen or heard about these things is because they weren't at Omaha Beach and Hollywood mm, focuses on Omaha bias. Beach because it was the deadliest, most brutal battle. But yeah. the reason that it was the deadliest battle was quite literally in part due to the fact that Hobart's funnies weren't there to help the Allies fight. These tanks are quite literally a victim of their own success. To give you an example of how big of an impact they had on the other beaches, the next deadliest beach after Omaha is Juno, and it had less than half the casualties. But Hobart and the 79th Armored Division's contributions aren't done on D-Day. At this point, Hobart decides rather than keeping all of his men together as one unit, like pretty much every other type of armored unit did, he decided split that he up. was going to split them up and attach them and their specialty tanks to all the other units of the Allied forces, uh, essentially turning his tank division into the special forces of tanks. Need didn't to get too spread mines, thin. Here's the crab. You need to scare some Germans. Here's the crocodile. By the end of World War II, 
knew, the Germans were so scared of the crocodile flamethrower tank that they would start to surrender at the mere sight of it. The 79th Ooh. Armored Division and Hobart's Funnies fought all the way through Dude, the Hobart. Theater, and when they finally came up to Germany, <clears throat> the first Allied forces to cross the Rhine into Germany did it in Hobart's yeah. duplex drive Sherman tanks. Because Hobart's Funnies and the 79th Armored Regiment were spread out amongst all the other units in the European theater, every time a unit did something special, credit was given to that unit and the contributions by Hobart, Hobart's men, and the Hobart funnies would go unnoticed and unrecognized. Not so anymore, baby. Not anymore. We got fat electrician. I'm behind it. We're bringing Hobart. Hobart's badasses. That's what they're called. And this was a story of Major General Percy Hobart. We're changing it. The man that pioneered modern tank warfare. The man that trained the men that beat Rommel in North Africa. The actual inventor of the Blitzkrieg tactic and one of the most important architects of D-Day and the Allied advance through Europe. In the pages of history, he is a victim of his own success because everywhere he wasn't was such a catastrophic shit show that it monopolized the spotlight and everywhere he was, things went so smooth that it wasn't worth reporting, so he went unnoticed. When people think of tank warfare in World War II, way too many people think of Erwin Rommel and Heinz Guderian, when in reality, they should be thinking of Percy Hobart, and I <clears> hope this video helps with that. Thanks for Let's watching. Let's go. Best way to support the channel is go buy some merch over the fatelectrician.com. Quack bang out. It's amazing how Americans, when learning American history, were you know, obviously a product of, uh, of Eurocentricism and Western-centric thinking, but then we have the Amerabu thinking where we're even neglecting the crazy history of our allies, our Western allies, like with the British. I hadn't heard of this guy. Okay, I hadn't heard of this guy and these some of these innovations that uh, of where they're getting credited to. Um, and that's so cool. That's so cool. We can get back to that. So incredible story there. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I learned a ton. This is so gonna be so many fun things. These are the little knickknacks I, I like to throw into a class to bring into the people that aren't like the hardcore, you know, military history kids. And let's be honest, teenagers aren't. There's a handful of them. But just some of those things that are just kind of interesting to to grab your attention and those will be fun to add to the uh um to my lessons so thank you to fat electrician for digging up this stuff and getting it out to the masses and thank you all for watching we'll see you next time bye